All right. Good to see people coming in. Welcome, 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 or as they would say in France, bienvenue, bonjour, bon après-midi, et uh, bonsoir, depending on where you are in the world today. Um, I'm assuming that the majority of us are here in the United States, but I know for a fact that several of our uh, panelists are joining us from France, from the uh, Loire Valley itself. And I suspect based on last year that we'll have a handful of people joining us from uh, other parts of the world too, either immediately uh, or uh, via recording a little bit later on. But as you're coming in, I can see already as the chat kicks up here, you know, um, people are veterans. They know to say hello from where they're from and all that other good stuff. So thank you all for, uh, for joining us uh, from New Jersey, from Nevada, from uh, various parts of uh, the good old US of A. And um, welcome, uh, Nola. Hello, Nola. Hello, New Jersey again. Um, and it's uh, going to be great to uh, to kick everything off here momentarily and welcome you to our, is, Lee Meng, is this our, our ninth BevCon, our eighth BevCon, our tenth BevCon? No, it's just our law. seven. It's number seven. So it feels like nine, feels like 10 with COVID these days, right? But we're, uh, <laughs> we're delighted that uh, so many people are joining us and um, we're going to be equally more delighted when we can all be in person again next year, because uh, needless to say, web, uh, Zoomlandia is getting boring for everybody. And um, I think we'd all rather give people uh, a real hug than a virtual hug and all of that other good stuff. So Li Meng, I'm gonna keep waiting for a couple of minutes as people are continuing to join us. And hopefully probably... not boring with wine. So no, not boring with wine. The wine. Are... I, I meant compared to me on screen and, and, <laughs> and stuff like that, you know, I'm. Uh... Not Evan, on your worst day, nobody could say you were boring, Aww. you know, and that you never have a worse day. I'm thrilled to work with you. Hi, I'm Madeline from Detroit. Yeah, we're going to introduce Madeline from Detroit in a minute. Um, but we're going to go ahead and uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started because it's going to be a little bit of housekeeping here at the beginning while we're waiting for everybody to join in. But first and foremost, um, I want to say to everybody, uh, actually go back one slide, um, Andrea, before we do that, that uh, unfortunately, uh, to our collective chagrin and to my uh, deep sadness, um, Tim is not with us today. Tim, unfortunately, um, got sick. Um, and I know Tim well enough, as Madeline does, having worked with him for a few decades, that if he says he's sick and he can't join you, he is really sick and not doing so well. So um, uh, to do take a walk on the dry side of the Loire Valley, I hope all of you appreciate my Lou Reed reference there. Um, I'm going to pull a second reference from the Beatles and say, I am Tim and Tim is me and we are here and I am the walrus. Uh, so I will be Tim Gazer today. Uh, Madeline will be Madeline Trafon. Madeline, can you just say hi to everybody from glorious Detroit, Michigan? Oh, and it is glorious today. Hello, everyone. This is our best time of year, fall. And you can all be wildly jealous that you're not in Michigan. <laughs> Very happy to see everyone's names coming in from everywhere. Great. And uh, and Madeline and I will be tag teaming on this presentation as we move forward and joined by some uh, guest speakers and all that other stuff. But for those of you who were desperately hoping to see Tim, I'm sorry to disappoint you. You're stuck with me. But um, suffice it to say, I've had a few Loire Valley wines in my time, and I think I can step in quite well. So on that note, let's go ahead and jump into the first slide. And um, housekeeping, we've got to go over our housekeeping. So this is not only true for this session, but for, for all sessions moving forward. Obviously, um, and needless to say, if you have not opened your wines already and we are in kit 236C, please do so. Uh, please note that is always the case with Master the World uh, kits. All of these wines are labeled as Master the World, so they're blind. However, this is not a blind tasting, only unexpected gems later on early next week will be a blind tasting. So if you wanna follow along knowing exactly what they are, you can simply peel and reveal by taking off that little tab of paper and unraveling your outer sleeve and knowing exactly what the wine is. Please know that um, we will uh, do Q&A. Um, Lee Mangu is here with us and uh, saw everyone at the very beginning. Um, we'll be managing all of that as she does so well each time. And um, all Q&A will be answered either live during the session, uh, at the end in the Q&A period, uh, or by email, or perhaps live in the happy half hour afterwards. Chat um, can be done for community. Please select all panelists and attendees, because if not, it only defaults to Madeline and me, 
And um, we're not going to be able to, uh, to do that all um, and rub our tummies and talk about wines at the same time and do all that. So please note that um, um, you're all here live, but if you wanted to reference it later and for our colleagues and friends who are not able to join us live and in living color, um, recordings of each session are gonna be available via the bit.ly link uh, noted in the overview document that you received on Friday. Um, and you can access them at any time as well as the tech sheets. And please, 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 at the end of this, uh, complete your surveys. The feedback is really important for our sponsors and um, for everybody else. And if you're interested in receiving more information and all that other good stuff. So um, with that said, on the next slide of housekeeping before we jump in, and with that, um, as with all Master of the World kits, uh, mtwwines.com, please, please, please do not wait. It's our first one, so we'll cut you slack today. But in the future, um, a jump start is great if you really want to analyze the wines blind do so in the blind format and uh, do it as a full workout or just quick picks if you wanna have fun. Go to mtwwines.com, um, enter the kit, in this case, 236C and boom, go through it. If you're um, competitive and wanna do the leaderboard, 608L under the join or create a group at the top of Taste and Reveal, which is where we'd be doing this anyway, is a great place to do so. It'll be fun as last year was any indication of following along and seeing how people are doing over the, uh, um, entire uh, process of, set of sessions. And then finally, in the MTW under Reveal Wine Profiles, which you can access either directly or um, after you've inserted your findings, um, Reveal Wine Profiles will give you lots more detailed information on the wines themselves, as well as profiles about the wineries and all that other good stuff. So without further ado, going to welcome a, a few other people here to the to the call with us. Um, they will be joining us later on, but so when you see them, you'll know who they are. Uh, we have Patricia Luno from Domaine Jean Payet, who will be joining us when we speak to Monatou Salon. Uh, Florent Beaumard, who will be joining us from uh, Domaine de Beaumard a little bit later when we yak Savignier. And also um, uh, on the call, I believe, uh, is uh, Emma Fontaine, and Emma is with Inter Loire. Inter Loire is the overall agency that oversees all things Loire Valley with respect to wine, and without whose um, generosity and support, we wouldn't be here today. And Emma, if you are on the call and would like to just say a, a few words of hello, we would love to hear from you. Um, so please turn yourself on um, microphone-wise and video-wise, and you're welcome to say hi if you're there, Emma. We'll go through a moment of radio silence to ascertain whether that is the fact. If not, she can join us later on in the happy half hour uh, to do everybody. Okay, well, that said, as far as the wines go, because you have all of your wines poured out, I would encourage you because, boy, I know I am the last person to ever want to do this, and I've been uh, had this happen to me as Madeline has as well too. Um, please feel free to jump in and enjoy the wines at your own pace. Taste as you would like, taste as you would enjoy. Um, please note that we will cover the wines individually. And when we are speaking to a specific wine, you will know there will be a slide there and either Madeline, myself or a winemaker will be speaking to it. But needless to say, I hate seminars where they talk for 55 minutes and then blast through six wines in 10. And we're not that kind of people, Evan? we ain't them. Yes. Um, Emma is now on if she wants ah. to say hello. Emma, would you love to please join us and just welcome everybody. We've got our delegation going and we'd love to hear from you to say bienvenue. Hi, thank you, Evan. Hello everyone. So I'm Emma Fontaine. I work for Loire Valley Wines in France. And I'm so happy that we're participating at BevCon this year. Um, I think that I hope you enjoy the theme um, with the, the Loire Valley white dry wines. And I'm really pleased that we've got two producers from the Loire Valley today. So you, you get to talk uh, to them later. Uh, so I'd like to thank Patricia for being online and Florent also for being online with us today. So thanks to both of you. And I hope you all enjoy the, the conference today. Thank you, Emma. Merci bien. Great. Um, on that note, I'm going to hand it over to you, Madeline. Yes, I should unmute myself. Hello, everyone. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here with you. And I was just thinking about studying the Loire at various times in my life, which you have either begun to do or are circling around and reminding yourself of it. Uh, you know, 
you can read through these slides as we go along and we'll riff on them a little bit, but at 625 miles long, France's longest river, and what does that mean in wine speak? It's impossible to generalize about viticulture Loire. And um, you know we have some wonderful maps, which by the way, we're going to review the one, hopefully you've got it in your cunning booklet that was in your kit. It's a spectacular booklet. Um, and it is, uh, comes to us from Van, uh, du, uh, du, uh, de Loire, Val de Loire. And there is the map that we'll be referencing and that you'll be following along. Um, but that said, what I was thinking of when I started uh, in the business more uh, decades ago than I cared to admit, what was available in a secondary market was Rosé d'Anjou, Vouvray, then Sancerre and Puy Fumé, really very little um, red wine. But when it became available to us finally, which it is with enthusiasm, things became references, especially the grape variety uh, Cabernet Franc. Um, you know, Sauvignon Blanc and its incarnations in um, the Upper Loire and beyond anything else, uh, Chenin. Um, so we've got wines in all styles ranging from red to white to rosé to sparkling. We've got, you know, bone searingly tart to unctuous in terms of dessert style, dessert style wines, but always with that fabulous, spectacular acidity. Um, rosés are a specialty for sure, and uh, sparkling wine, you know, this is the area that produces uh, a, a stunning amount of sparkling wine. Um, and the other thing too, the thumbprint of this region to me is the unbelievable values of the wines from here, and value with the capital B, meaning wines that way overperform in their price points. Today we are, I know Muscadet is going to forgive us, we are, uh, because it's in our heart, that we are celebrating um, the grape varieties Sauvignon Blanc and Chenin in, its, uh, in their dry incarnations. Um, and um, the thing I think that touches all of us in the business about the Loire, and Evan made this comment earlier, that if he had to do one wine dinner with, you know, 12 wines from one region, it would be from the Loire Valley, right? Because of the diversity. Um, but I think also beyond that, if you dig a little bit deeper, you have the acidity we refer to, a distinct minerality throughout the different expressions of terroir moving from the Atlantic inland. Um, and you have terrific varietal expression, very rarely, if ever, masked with oak. Uh, easily enjoyed, certainly, uh, but with complexity. Um, so we can't generalize, but we can certainly continue to dig deep and learn about uh, Loire wines and all of their expressions. Evan? Thanks, Madeline. Yeah, this is an extraordinary area and a, and a, and a, and a cradle for so much of what French culture uh, is, is based upon. Next slide, please, um, Andrea. So when we talk about the, the Loire, uh, historically, it's, it's relevant. I mean, you can go back and whether you're talking about Rabelais or Joan of Arc, uh, the Hundred Years' War, uh, the language, and I always remind people that, you know, I, I was, I'm a big foodie, as, as many of you know, I was a chef before I was a sommelier, and in reading a great book, if you're a food person, pick up Waverly Roots, The Foods of France, or Food of France, and um, he reminds us so well that long before Paris, long before all these Michelin restaurants, long before anything else, French food as we know it, the, the bastion of French food, started in the Loire Valley. I mean, it really is a very, very important place for that. And um, suffice it to say, Madeline talked about the diversity, um, styles, soils, grapes, characteristic appellations. And uh, I meant that in my heart of hearts because, you know, how many other places in one singular region could you start with a sparkling wine, move to a dry white wine, go to something off white, shift into a rosé, then go red, end up with dessert and everything. Um, Loire Valley gives you the, the, the ability to be able to do so. And as a testament to the region, um, obviously it's now on the World Heritage List as well. So very, very important. But for a lot of people who are not wine people, as we move on to the next slide, um, it is not about the wines. It's really about the chateaus. Um, for people, and I have a lot of friends who are architecturally driven, historically driven, and travel the world. And needless to say, the Chateau at Chambord 
and which is one of the most recognizable of all chateaus, not only in France, but, but globally, um, and the largest in the Loire Valley, I would add, um, is just a stunning uh, piece of, of architecture. My dad was an architect, and it was built for Francis I uh, a long, 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 long time ago. Did you know, Madeline, it was originally designed as a hunting lodge? Who knew, huh? I no, I didn't know that, but yeah. Tim told me that it has like a... a an unbelievable staircase. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, if you look architecturally, for those of you who spent time in, in, in Turkey, you'll know that um, Francis I, when he decided he wanted to build this hunting lodge, actually had it designed around the skyline of Constantinople. So who knew? Okay. Who knew? Second slide of uh, Chateau, for those of you who are equally Chateau folk, is uh, Chenonceau. Uh, and Chenonceau, which will be appearing on the screen momentarily, Still on Chambord. I love Chambord. That's why we're staying on it. So and you know what? The reason we're staying there is we have to mention that uh, rumor has it that uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, completed his life a stone's throw from this. Uh, there you go. There you go. Yes. Well, Chen also perhaps is not as noteworthy for people as Chambord, but but needless to say, just uh, off the river Cher and in the namesake town of uh, Chen also, which dates back um, to its main construction to, I don't know, 1514. It's not particularly new. In that regard, nobody's laughing. All right, but it's a beautiful chateau I'm as laughing. well. I'm laughing. All right, and on that stem, let's go back to wine, Madeline. To you. Okay, so we've already talked a little bit about the, um, you know, the diversity of wines from the Loire. We didn't really talk. You know, we're celebrating white wines today, but we can't forget the expression of reds. And I think I mentioned briefly Cabernet Franc, but certainly Pinot Noir and Gamay as well. But just to remind us, as we move from the Pays Nantes uh, to the West Inland, we've got Muscadet, a.k.a. Milan de Bourgogne with Fall Blanche planted there. In anjou sur we've got, um, you know, really the, the land of Chenin and Cab Franc with the Appalachians anjou Savignere, which we're going to become intimate with, um, uh, thanks to our friend uh, Florent a little bit later. Um, Coteau du Layon, Cour du Chaume, and Bonizo, all of which are spectacular expressions of uh, dessert style wines. And then uh, moving um, further east to the Touraine, this is where um, uh, red wine becomes incredibly singular, uh, in, uh, expressed by Cab Franc and Chinon Bourgueil and Saint Nicolas de Bourgueil. And my French accent is not as good as yours, Evan, because uh, I can't move out of present tense, but I have enthusiasm. And this is absolutely where we're talking about the seat of, you know, one of the great ambassadors, ambassadors of the Loire of Vouvray, uh, followed by um, the more esoteric appellations, at least in my market of Mont-Louis and Cheverny. And then finishing up with um, the Upper Loire, which, you know, is funny, uh, is actually, you know, the centre, the central vineyards, because this is really exactly the center of France. Uh, even though we've gone down this, uh, you know, over 600 mile river, and this is Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir land, um, you know, in a very different expression than we find in Bordeaux or in Burgundy, and certainly celebrated uh, by some in Great. Well, let's, let's hit some statistics. And I, I want to go back to a point that you made uh, earlier, Madeline, which is about sort of the punching above its weight or, or just this sort of mm -hmm. underappreciation factor that, that folks perhaps beyond this webinar who are sommeliers and retailers and, and media and all that who really appreciate for the Loire is, it's one of those things like, did you know that? And I would just sort of add up there that, did you know that the, that the Loire Valley is the number one producer of AOC or AOP wines in all of France. Um, white, white, right. White wines, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. it's early for me. Um, I mean, so you have two hours, you have three hours on me. That's oh not, yeah, you know, I'm ready, I'm ready for uh, a cappuccino. There but, you go, and and then after uh, our friends in Provence, they're the number two producer of rosé AOC and o AOP wines in, in all of France, which I think a lot of people don't really think about. Maybe you throw another place in there, but they are, one and two and two very, very important categories. Probably, I think a few of us at least in, intuitively guess because of the importance of Saumur and Cremant de la Loire, et cetera, that it is, of course, the number one region for sparkling wine production outside of Champagne. All of this is, of course, encapsulated in 51 Appellations and six uh, PGIs that we find there, uh, the 24 um, grape varieties of which we just touched on a handful, but there are, of course, others and um, an average production of about 325 million bottles of wine annually, quite a chunk of wine. 
All right, what are we tasting today? Hopefully you jumped in already. Um, Madeline sort of alluded to the fact that we're gonna focus on two of the three primary white uh, grapes that we find in the Loire Valley, again, with our uh, tip of a bray to our friends uh, in the uh, West, in uh, the, the land of uh, Muscadet, but we're gonna be focusing on Sauvignon Blanc through the prism of three wines, uh, a Turenne Sauvignon, a Mont Salon and a Quincy. And then we will be moving to Chenin, where we'll be focusing in on a, a Saumur a Blanc, uh, a Savignere, and then uh, finishing up with a Vouvray. All of these six wines are dry, um, knowing that particularly um, with our friends in Chenin, we have varying degrees of dryness on the open market today. So you wanna show us that map again, Madeline? It's such a cool map, but maybe- Oh yes, and by the uh, and we're going to talk through this. Um, you know, a couple of people are asking about the um, asking about the booklet. If you did not receive it, Andrea, you can make it available to the um, uh, in a digital format. Correct. Um, at least uh, that's what uh, Evan and I had um, thought to mention. So, yes, we'll be no emailing worries. that out with a follow up email. So everyone, even and if you didn't get the hard copy, you no will worries. get that yes. um, via email. Great. Because this is a really killer map. And I'll tell you why. When I, you know, Google Images and now Google Earth are my best friends in trying to remember where something is from, especially a region this diverse and complex. Um, but this is a particularly nice map, uh, especially so I'm lucky enough to see the small print, um, you know, and trying to find a good map of the Loire. So, you know, we're moving from uh, Pei Nante, where um, Muscadet. Um, rules and uh, then we're moving into Anjou uh, Samur, the area in um, red where we're going to be tasting two wines. Uh, the number four wine, the Samur, which is located in the southeastern portion of the region, and Savignere, which is on the north side um, of the Loire. And then we are going to um, the Touraine, uh, the most famous wine there is undeniably uh, Vouvray. And Touraine, I love to overstate the obvious, takes its uh, name from Tours, uh, this beautiful city in the center. And we are tasting um, number one wine, the Paul Bouis Sauvignon Blanc, comes from actually this small little um, uh, township called Montrichard. And then we're going to finish up with wine number six, um, Vouvray. So both of these are... Um, uh, well, we have we have actually Sauvignon Blanc from uh, um, uh, Paul Buisse and Chenin from the Bouvray Number no. Six. So we're riding both horses, two grape varieties from that area, and we're finishing up in um, the Central Vineyards, a aka uh, the Upper Loire, with um, Quincy, which is going to be wine number no. three, and uh, Menetou Salon, which is wine number no. two. So Quincy is west of uh, the city of Bourges. And uh, Manetou Salon is just a stone stroll north of uh, Sancerre. Madeline, before you jump into mm -hmm. talking um, more specifically about uh, about Turin and all that, can I ask you what just some overview points? You know, just very broad strokes, and we can do this before mm -hmm. we um, start our, our uh, voyage and journey into mm -hmm. Chenin Blanc a little bit later too. What are your thoughts, your broad strokes on Sauvignon Blanc in general and the Loire Valley? Uh, I love you where your, your ESP is working. Evan and I have known each other for a long time. We actually grew up in the business uh, on parallel tracks, though his has been more, um, you know, expressive than mine. I've been very happy to sort of hide in plain sight in Detroit, but we do read each other's minds on occasion. And I was just thinking, because I've been sitting here sipping on wine number one, um, two, and three. And to me, Sauvignon Blanc is... Um, you know, the essence of it is in the, uh, the Upper Loire um, because what it displays is the grape variety at its most primal, certainly acidity that ranges from mouthwatering to piercing and even dominant, um, you know, flavors that are, you know, certainly pulled by citrus, most notably, I would say white grapefruit. I never think of pink grapefruit in, um, in the Loire, though I'm sure it surfaces, you know, so in that respect, it's wildly different than uh, New Zealand, you know, really very, very rarely touched by any confusing oak tones. Um, and a little bit of pyrazine, but in its most friendly, you know, you get sort of this um, raw bell pepper quality and maybe snow pea. Uh, you also get, you know, these wonderful herbs like lemongrass, um, chive, cilantro. Uh, but to me, it's 
the, the, the pungent aromatics are unmistakably old world and Loire, and so is the mouthfeel. And that acidity pulls the best wines. It's just, it, you know, it brings them to terrific uh, length. Would you like me to opine about Chenin? <laughs> uh, we can do that. Why don't we do that when we get to Chenin? When we get to uh, Chenin, because we yeah. just talked two, about Sauvignon. Two questions. Um, mm -hmm. I think there was a quick comment. Are mm -hmm. all of our first three wines 100% uh, Sauvignon Blanc? Oui. The answer is we. Oui. Oui. And um, mm -hmm. just my own thoughts. And I think what's interesting, and I've chatted with several of uh, several folks over the over the year years, last couple of years, uh, many of whom are on, on the seminar with us today. But it's interesting, and I'd just be curious to your thoughts specific to Loire Valley and specific to Sauvignon, Madeleine, um, if with some of the very warm vintages we've had mm -hmm. recently and climate change being there, are you finding a, uh, that the wines are changing a little bit? Are you finding that that piercing acidity mm -hmm. may not be as piercing anymore, or that white grapefruit may be kissing a little bit towards the pink grapefruit a bit? Or are you finding that the signatures are still so strong um, that we don't worry about it? I think you ask the best questions. I think um, unlike, let's say, Chablis, where I think, you know, what's happening if, you know, the alcohol inches up just a little bit or the ripeness does, the wine simply show better young. Um, you know, and then the mouthfeel is a little more forgiving. They don't need food. I think with Sauvignon Blanc, we tend to get, especially with winemaking tendencies, inching a little bit more regularly towards lees contact, right? We get um, sort of a fleshier mouthfeel uh, and expression. I think the aromatics to me have not changed much. I don't mm -hmm. think we've even gone near anything that verges on tropical classically, unless it's in the, the warmest years. And I I don't know, at least to my perception, I haven't thought about the acidity levels changing. I have thought about it when I taste Chablis with regularity. I haven't thought about it when I think of uh, Loire Sauvignon Blanc. Maybe the wines appear a little bit more balanced in their youth. And that of course is to our um, great advantage since we drink them young slash too young. There you go. All right, on to the Touraine. Here we go. Okay, so I've been drinking it actually sipping it, you know, and I will tell you as you're reading that beautiful slide, don't forget this to me is one of the most important things about labels, regardless of the size of the bottle. If you flip this around, Master of the World has done, you know, thank you, a very um, inclusive job, which I'm sure has to do with sharing with us fully and also legality and telling us everything about this wine that would be germane on front and back labels, including drum roll, the importer. And this is Cape Classics. It is eminently gettable, um, by the way, and it's a staggering value. I put BTG next to mine and I don't buy wines to pour by the glass anymore, but I pretend I do. So here we are in the Touraine, um, often called the Garden of France. This is Chateau Land, um, wildly popular tourist destination that I'm sure in many, if not most cases, <laughs> has nothing to do with the wine, though the wine is cer certainly con uh, you know, consumed. Um, the most famous um, appellations are uh, Bouvray that we've talked about from Chenin, Chinon and Bourgogne uh, from Cab Franc. Um, and then it, it does um, express varietal bottlings of um, these grape varieties as well. Um, this um, used to be a playground for France's pre-revolutionary aristocrats. Um, in terms of um, terroir, we're talking about a preponderance of Tufo Blanc, calcareous, but with terrific drainage, arguably better than limestone. And Emma can always correct me or Evan if we, you know, say something that's assumed and incorrect. Um, and the wine that we're about to taste um, is off of the Loire's tributary, the Cher, east of Tours. Um, and also we're inching inward, so we have, you know, a slightly more uh, continental climate with, wet, with uh, less of, um, you know, influence from uh, the Atlantic. And as we all know, that maritime influence wanes as you go inland, even if there aren't, you know, coastal ranges uh, to stop the winds and such. And we deal with that in Northern Michigan as well. So uh, let's go on to the next slide and talk about this wine. And by the way, I'm going to go ahead and if you don't mind while you're reading this, um, I'm going to talk about the wine because I hate, uh, I mean, I'm going to talk about what I perceive because I personally hate talking about a wine without us experiencing it together. It's like saying, hold on, don't start the music. Let me tell you about it before you can trust your ears, right? And your other sensibilities like your heart to have an honest reaction to it. And I, by the way, 
I'm doing a little MTW plug here. I'm always so touched and grateful and impressed that whenever I open my Master of the World wines and I get them too cold in the fridge, pour them out 45 minutes in advance, and the aromas are true. They don't take any time to get their act together. And, you know, going along what I was talking about before, this has that pure expression of white grapefruit, a little bit of, you know, uh, um, citrus oil that gives it some richness. Um, and I would say um, mouth watering acidity, but with a light touch, it doesn't need food to balance it out, um, but it certainly will slice through anything or welcome a little lemon or lime to calm the acid down. It's on its toes, you know, it's a ballerina Sauvignon Blanc and we're talking under $15 um, retail and that's probably on a bad day. Um, I actually had to um, uh, email these folks, Paul Buis, is the domain, but it is um, it was purchased around 2010 when he, um, the founder owner, uh, decided to retire and sold the the estate to um, the Chenier family. His one of his best friends was Pierre Chenier, and I've gone back and forth a couple of times um, with his son Philippe. Um, Francois is the winemaker, and he has a third son Louise. So basically, um, Paul Buis whose estate has stayed intact, is now owned um, by the Chenier family. And here we have an absolutely wonderful picture of these, um, this, uh, this cave that has a specific name, Cave de la Boule Blanche, which means the caves of the white ball, referring to the tufo. Uh, this was a cave dwelling uh, initially, and um, the Tufo was used uh, for reparation of the, of the, a lot of the Loire castles. So, you know, there's a connection between the chateau and the terroir here. The gentleman um, that we see on the right, I don't see it. Let's see, hopefully they're there. Ah, yes, they are. Um, are, and I'm not sure who's who, but we've got, um, we've got uh, Paul Guise, which I think is the gentleman to the left, and uh, Louis Chenier on the right. So we've got both families represented. And actually I asked the question if these chateaus are in the family. And he said, no, he just wanted us to see pictures of the um, beautiful depth of history of the Loire. And I believe the one in the, um, the east, the um, southeast corner, the lower right corner is uh, Amboise. And they, um, you know, this is a wine that to me is asking for goat cheese both to match the tartness of the acidity would be spectacular with salad um, and, uh, you know, would be appropriate for um, any appetizers that you wanted to, um, to throw at it. So we've got 100% uh, Sauvignon Blanc from an area uh, just east of Tours from a, a contained state. Um, and I think the, uh, the value is spectacular. Do you want to add anything to that, Ev? No, I, I just only that I concur with you that, that Touraine Sauvignon specifically is um, sort of under the radar for everybody. I mean, we mm -hmm. tend to gravitate eastward uh, and, um, you know, focus in on the center vineyards, which I'll talk about momentarily. But don't overlook the Touraine. Um, actually, the first time I ever had it was probably, gosh, in the uh, mid to late 80s when um, uh, Serena Sutcliffe and David Peppercorn actually were over in the United States on a visit with the Touraine people and had a bottled a Sauvignon Blanc, I guess, a negotiation. Sauvignon Blanc with their names on it, if you will, back at the time. Um, and I was just struck at number one, what an amazing value for money what, that it was, mm -hmm. but the purity of fruit and the purity of Sauvignon uh, character uh, that it showed. So don't overlook just straight to Rennes uh, Sauvignon. Um, they can be delightful wines. And um, yeah, I thought that too. I, I thought they owned that chateau in the lower. You know, to your point, uh, yeah, I did too. Well, that's, you know, I love just to overstate the obvious and I love asking the stupid question because half mm -hmm. of you in the academy won't ask it. I will, right? But I, I thought maybe it's their family estate. Oh no. You know, to your point, as the crow flies from where this, um, this wine is harvested, because actually legally it's a relatively large area where mm -hmm. Turin Sauvignon Blanc can come from, but this comes from a contained, um, uh, a state um, around the small commune of Montrichard. It is not very far if you fly east, crow that you are, uh, to what, the Ruyi and the Minitou Salon and Sancerre. So, you know, you're just looking a little bit further west to get values that are, you know, really going to undercut, especially wines like Sancerre and Pouffumet, probably by half. Yeah. 
Great. All right, let's move our brains to the center vineyards now, the Centre Loire, if you will, and talk about what we're finding in these um, classic places. If we can move to the next slide. Um, Centre Vin, the Centre de Loire, and, and I think it was appropriate that Madeline pointed out um, earlier that literally they're called the Central Vineyards because you know, people go, well, shouldn't it be the Eastern Loire? Because that's okay. really what it is, but it has to do with the geographical epicenter of being France, as the name implies. But this is, of course, you know, one of the classic homes of Sauvignon Blanc. And again, if you look at sort of Bordeaux being a different take on it as part of a blend and all that other, for pure Sauvignon Blanc and, and specific signature Sauvignon flavor, uh, uh, Sancerre is it for most people. Um, and I remember, again, um, dating myself, that was literally all you could buy for the longest period of time. There was a little bit of La Doucette, Puy Fume, and things like that. But all of these other areas that we'll be, you know, we talk about uh, Montu Salon, which we'll be talking about in a minute, or Roy or, or Cancy that we'll also be trying what used to be considered like the satellites of Sancerre. Very much we had the satellites of Bordeaux, and now those have become prominent down in the um, south uh, southwest. That these areas have become much more prominent to everybody today, and some of the better values are there. I remember buying Sancerre, um, no no less Mont Damné Sancerre from uh, Henri Bourgeois in the eighties for fifty six bucks a case. Mm -hmm. I think you can probably put a, a, a one plus in front of that now uh, in terms of what the value is. And upside is. to us being older, Evan. There you go, that's what we get. But um, <laughs> just the wines being so distinctive and so amazing. But don't forget these lesser known appellations um, that are producing some supreme quality wines. And we have the pleasure and luxury of trying two of them there. And also don't expect, don't forget the reds. I mean, I think we all are so um, color coded to white wine that we forget that there's a Pinot Noir, particularly lovely Pinot Noir in Sancerre, um, again, which makes sense given the proximity relative relative to Burgundy uh, and, and other parts too. And uh, Cote de Genois, again, probably the most under the radar there, along with Chateau Mayon, uh, can produce some superb wine. So we're going to taste now a Monitou Salon. Um, so let's talk just quickly about it first. But go ahead and jump into that second glass if you haven't done so al already. Um, this is a lovely uh, part of the world, as I said before, kind of a satellite uh, that goes back to um, 1063 and 1100 and has grown across 10 different hamlets uh, along the, the, in the shale department. And um, you can see all the statistics there, which you can find in the books a little bit later. But uh, uh, another area that I just think, um, I, I'm just so happy to see us giving um, upfront out loud recognition to an area that I, you know, for years thought I was one of the few people that loved it, but it's great to see so many other people are loving it today. Mm -hmm. And as we move to the wine, um, mm -hmm. one of a couple of cases today, I'm gonna sort of step back um, and really allow uh, our, our, our speaker, uh, we have, uh, I always say Patricia, but I guess Patricia, Patricia, I don't know, you could correct me, but uh, <laughs> Patricia Luno is here, or Patricia Luno is here from uh, the domain, and she can walk us a little bit through um, this delicious wine. So please, Patricia, floor is yours. Bonjour à tous. Um, so I'm very happy to be connected to you. I just hope that my uh, English won't be too bad. Um, thank you very much for letting me uh, tell you a few words about uh, From Menu to Salon, so a small and uh, tiny vineyard in, in the center Loire Valley. So I'm Patricia, uh, the granddaughter of Jean Tellier, who created the domain with my grandmother uh, in the middle of the 50s. Uh, Today, I have the chance to run it with uh, Olivier, my husband, who is native from Burgundy and after my parents. So it's a family estate. We both are passionate, but uh, I think you can find this characteristic in each producer you meet. Uh, passion is uh, necessary to, to be a wine producer, uh, to carry on, for example, despite of the climate changes or climate uh, damages, like in 2021, for example. You are testing our main to saddle white, 19, which is our main cuvee. 19 is very fruity uh, with flower notes, uh, good complexity and, uh, and has a good acidity. I think these main qualities are balance and pureness. Uh, as you, these two qualities were not very easy to get in 19 because um, it was a very dry and warm year. And as you probably know, Sauvignon Blanc doesn't like uh, that kind of weather. 
warmth and dryness are not good for aromas, we, which are less elegant, less powerful, and for acidity, which is lower. Uh, acidity, of course, uh, a good acidity is part of the identity of white or white. It's like, um, to me, it's like a spinal column. So thanks to our farming methods, uh, organic, but also, and above all, biodynamic, the vines could stand that uh, unusual condition uh, and didn't suffer too much. Uh, we used plants and, and essential oils to help the vines to resist the climate. Uh, for example, when the day was very hot, we spread chamomile tisane at the end of the day, just before the night, to distress the wine. The vine what did you spread? I'm sorry, can you repeat that, Patricia? I didn't hear it. Um, chamomile. Tisane. Oh, mm. um, so it may seem a detail, but our actions in the vineyard or in the winemaking are often details, but one detail plus one detail plus one detail makes make big differences uh, at the end. Um, I think it's the same in winemaking. We give time to the juice to become wine. Uh, for example, uh, long fermentations, uh, long aging, uh, and it's important for us that our wine reflects the millésime and our wonderful terroir um, in Menut Salon made of clay and limestone. We don't like to erase the nature. It's important for us to, to respect her. So I hope you, you will find this Menut Salon um, I would say alive, but um, in French we say vivant. Vivant, yes. Mm -hmm. Same way, same word. You, if you don't mind, I'm going to comment on it because I have it in my glass and there's a lot of conversation going on in the chat room about it, Patricia, all positive. But I think you did absolutely, you know, this is a great expression of a warmer vintage because you do get slightly, somebody mentioned pineapple, a little bit more tropical aromas, a little bit richer, not softer. The acidity is mouthwatering and it's and it's continuing, but you get a little bit more of a plump, you know, gras um, mouthfeel to this. And I just think it's wonderful because um, you could have this actually, you know, with relatively um, rich food. And somebody made the comment that it's more flor floral too, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the smell of uh, flowers. So my compliments, and I hope, Andrea, you show the next slide because it's got a great Thank picture you very much. of Patricia and Olivia. Yeah, I like, she's, here. she's clearly very strong. Look at that. <laughs> she can hold her husband up with one arm. I think that's really impressive. No, but it is a beautiful uh, uh, shot uh, of the of the vine the vineyard vivant uh, on one side and and of just the paysage on the other uh, just a, a lovely thing and I hope everybody is taking from this if you're not super familiar with this a little bit more under the radar appellation um, to to uh, take a moment of it and I remember having been over in Europe in 2019 and landing in um, Paris and then moving actually to Normandy before that it didn't drop below 100 and something degrees Fahrenheit for the entire two weeks. Uh, I was there until the second to last day. So to be able to get a wine of such balance with still demonstrated acidity in what was clearly such a warm year um, is really uh, a really important thing. So Madeline, let's switch gears now and talk a little bit about Gassi. Okay. Bravo and Patricia, you should never feel insecure about your English because you just gave a, a very sophisticated expression of this wine in your... Uh, I don't know if it's your second language, but bravo to the wine and, and to you. So nice to have your company. So we are in Quincy, which if your customers say and your guests say Quincy, you just smile and let them because it rose by any other name, right? Um, this is so historic, actually. Not only was it mentioned in a document by a pope in the 1100s, it is, I love this uh, stat, the second appellation post CDP, post uh, Chateauneuf du Pop. So go figure, I didn't know that. Um, the variety is, you know, dominantly Sauvignon Blanc, but a little bit of Sauvignon Gris is allowed. I'm not that familiar with it. Maybe Emma can opine in a little bit about Sauvignon Gris, but this particular wine we are experiencing is 100% Sauvignon Blanc. I think if you look at your map, if you have your, um, you know, if you have your booklet, 
we're talking um, an area um, west of Puy Fumet Sancerre and Manitou Salon. It is, you know, very specifically on the west bank of the Cher, which is a tributary of the um, the Loire, where wine number one was positioned up against a little bit further north. Um, the the terroir, specifically the soil, is very different here. You know, we're moving to sand with gravel. Um, you know, so we have um, certainly well draining uh, soil and sand with silt. And uh, rumor has it this enables the Sauvignon Blanc to ripen early. Um, and what else to tell you about it? Ah, yes, because of the River Cher, this particular um, appellation can see um, to us, not nearly as famous or well known as Sancerre or um, Puy Fumet. Um, enjoyed tremendous popularity in Paris because of the Cher River, you know, two rivers proximity that could get them, um, you know, to, uh, to the uh, Parisian bistros and, uh, and restaurants. And we can go to the next slide. This particular one um, is, and I don't think I've ever seen this in my career. I could be wrong. It might be brain death. But I love seeing that this is très vieille vigne, you can see, so very old vines. And just a reminder that it's not um, a specification that's controlled by law, but that a producer can, um, you know, throw in there, especially if they want to PS it with the fact that these are running routinely over 50 years old with some 75 years old. And while you're looking at the stat, before we go um, to the art on the next slide, I want to taste it with you because you know, Evan, the um, the uh, the diversity of these three Sauvignon Blancs, bravo! It's not just intellectual; it's in the glass. And that smell to me is Upper Loire, Center Loire um, Sauvignon Blanc. You know, it's a little bit more serious. I'm looking at um, the alcohol level is running. Ah, I wasn't. You know, I'm not asleep. It's a little bit over 14. So. It smells like it's going to have shoulders. It smells like it's going to have a little bit more weight and I can see it in the glass as it moves. And on the palate, you get weight, but you also have this acidity that commands your attention. It's not taking a back seat at all. It drives the wine. It is asking for food to balance it out. This is really serious. Um, you know, Loire Valley Sauvignon Blanc. In terms of flavors, it's definitely grapefruit pith and rind. Um, you know, not so much of, you know, I think fresh um, green herbs for sure. I always think of like, I just mowed the lawn because I like to mow the lawn or fresh um, parsley. Um, and, you know, I come away with something that's full bodied, um, weighty, balanced, has a life ahead of itself because I think it hasn't, started to um, express layers, but I know they're in there. It's pretty impressive, Sauvignon Blanc. This is um, an estate wine. Uh, I believe they produce under 10,000 cases. Hélène Mardon runs the domain. Uh, ah, yes, and there are the 10,000 cases. I had done a little bit of reading as well. And um, I think, you know, they uh, make a point of telling us that they use indigenous yeast, something, a practice that a lot of winemakers buy into. Uh, because they feel that um, it adds to the complexity of the wine. And um, let's see the next slide, because I think Hélène Martin is uh, <laughs> pretty fierce looking in her, uh, her vineyards. I'm wondering if anyone else wants to, um, to express their perception of the wine, but you know, this is, here's the short version and the simple version. You have a can see that is uh, what? $21.99, you know, certainly in the low 20s retail um, that uh, can provide a terrific alternative to uh, Sancerre and Puy Fume. And I'm not dogging Sancerre and Puy Fume. Make no mistake, I'll pay money for them. My wallet's out. But boy, how cool to get a wine that if you gave it to me blind, you know, gives me um, as much expression of the old world and of this grape variety from old vines. And Evan, I know, my, my ESP is working. You're going to talk about the concentration of the palate coming from vines that are, um, for the most 50 part, to 75 50 years old. Right? Exactly. No, I, I think this is a, a superb expression. I'm just so uh, 
pink tickled, tickled pink. I don't know what the expression is <laughs> to be able to show people that you can achieve, um, you know, these levels of um, expression of volume, if you will, in wines that don't necessarily carry, you know, the Sancerre name on them or even a Puy Fume name on them, but uh, we're getting that. So I, I applaud, uh, I applaud Emma and the team for suggesting that we it's went a little a bit It's a lot of off. wine. Yeah, and yeah. Um, to that point, sorry to cut you off because I don't want to forget, this is uh, an importer that's well known to all of us, uh, Skernik. Yep. So, you know, you can get on the phone and uh, Call Michael. annoy them. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right. uh, before we move to the next wine, and I'm just mindful of time and the fact that we've got three wines um, to still taste and the mm -hmm. fact that we want to, you know, have some time for everybody at the end. Just a quick couple of, and by the way, I love, I, I wrote smells like it's going to have shoulders. I'm going to start using that one. That's a great <laughs> one. Thank but you. Can you you're, I, I, I promised I'd come back to you. Your general thoughts about Chenin before we uh, embark on these uh, next three wines. You know, Chenin is, you know, uh, something beloved and dreaded in blind tasting circles because it can be confusing. I can speak to it in you know, and I'm talking very specifically about Old World Chenin, which for every practical purpose is the Loire Valley, correct? It shares some characteristics with Riesling, notably acidity. And also, um, to me, the dominant fruit is always a combination of fresh and dried peaches um, and apricots, right? Stone fruit. Um, but it also has this other really hard to pin down maddening characteristic that those, you know, village elders of us who used to wash our cashmere sweaters when we could A, afford them and B, didn't have washing machines, handy would call wet wool and some people call hay or an expression of earth. Um, it also, you know, if you're ever caught in a tussle on blind tasting between Chenin, Old World, you know, French Chenin and German or Austrian dry Riesling, look at the alcohol level because you're talking about a warmer growing region. Um, what I love about the classic expressions of Chenin and the Loire is um, that the range of, uh, you know, bone dry to very sweet. And, you know, when we taste, um, for instance, the Sabinier, hopefully that will be an eye opening wine to some of you who have never really experienced that because I think. Our guests, especially when they approach a Vouvray, will think, oh boy, is it going to be dummy sec? Is there any RS? And I will remind us that um, Chenin Blanc's acidity will digest um, unfermented grape sugars terrifically. And what I mean by that, you know, when you find out what the grams per liter RS is, you might um, be surprised. So, you know, we're talking about this combination of stone fruit. Um, oh, florality, you know, beautiful fruit blossoms that can be fresh, but are often sort of potpourri. There's a waxiness and, a and you know, uh, an, an impression of botrytis, whether it's actual or imagined. Um, and so, you know, you've got fruit, you've got florals, you've got wax, honey, and um, sometimes lanolin. And then that, you know, elusive wet wool, hay, uh, earth characteristic. And behind it all, I almost forgot, Evan, and this goes with Loire Sauvignon Blanc as well, that maddening term that sommeliers use, minerality, which <laughs> drives consumers crazy. Please try to define that whenever you're speaking to normal human beings, capital N, capital H, capital B, as, you know, river rock, salinity, chalk, um, you know, wet yeah. stone, chalk, yeah, you know, yeah, that impression, yeah. because I think that... Um, Luar Shana at its best yeah. uh, has it in spades yeah. plus plus. Uh, absolutely, I, I, and I would I would echo that comment and just add to people and those people who've tasted with me before know that if you say the word fruity and you don't qualify it, I generally get really pissed <laughs> off. If you describe minerality or earthiness, that's great. But you know, when specifically when speaking to um, anybody, when you're trying to convey your thoughts. The more specificity, be it organic or inorganic, or you know what kind is it? Is it you know is it compost or is it um, forest f mushrooms? Is it is it to your point flinch or is it chalk? I mean, we've had enough of those, and you're it's incumbent on all of us to try and explain that in such a way that people uh, do understand it. So, and, just and a, frankly, to your yeah. point, if you say you know not like garden earthy, not like turned earth, but more of an inorganic minerality. And, and you know, a PS to this, and forgive me for interrupting you, because I forgot, again, the elephant in the room. These are two grape varieties, Sauvignon Blanc and Chenin Blanc, that are either highly aromatic or semi-aromatic, mm -hmm. depending on who you talk to, but they're not 
neutral. They're not like Pinot Gris and Chardonnay that take their characteristic largely from where they're grown and how they're made. Would you agree with that, Evan? Absolutely. And I was, I have a list of flavors I was going to go over in my thing and you checked off every single one of them. So I don't need to spend any time there. All right, <laughs> let's get it specific here. And we're going to start in the area of Samoa. And Samoa um, is, is, is uh, an area that, you know, as you can see by virtue of the red um, outline on the map, they're pretty large. And, you know, I think a lot of us associate it um, incorrectly, just exclusively with being sparkling wine. And yes, there's a lot of sparkling somewhere out there and, you know, a lot of uh, wonderful bubbles, but there are other wines that, that are made there too. We'll get into them in a minute. First of all, um, you know, if, again, for the castle uh, chasers out there, beautiful area. And what's interesting is that the limestone that is uh, so, this Tufo limestone that is so um, signature to this region not only manifests itself often in the wine, in the nature of the wine's terroir, but also physically in buildings uh, and chateaus and things like that in which the uh, uh, things are constructed there. Um, not only sparkling wine, but obviously dry white wine. And one of the best reds of the entire region, of course, is somewhere Champigny. And um, we're not talking about it today. We're only in the land of whites, but do check that out a little bit too. Limestone, yes, a little bit of flintiness, yes. And some Caillou, those little pebbles um, definitely help define this area. Don't overlook, there's a little bit of Chardonnay to be found here too. Remember, as we talked about very earlier, there are 24 different grapes in the Loire Valley. So we're not gonna hit every one of them all the time and we're focusing in on the big ones. But let's move to our first glass of wine, which is a Saumur, uh, specifically from uh, the hamlet, the township of Saint-Cyr. Uh, this is uh, from a single vineyard called Le, Le Onidier. Um, I tried to track down if this was an actual UD or not, and I couldn't find anything there. It may be, but if not, it wasn't available to me as I was looking through it here. But um, I think it's a lovely expression of, uh, of what it is. And what's interesting to remember within uh, the overall commune of, of Samoa, if you will, that there are these sort of townships, these hamlets. And Sancio, to me, um, is one I've enjoyed because it's really, perhaps more so, I don't know, comparing it to say like Brez or one of the other adjacent areas, it's more weightier, it's more powerful, it's more volume, it's deeper. Uh, you do get this sort of strong tufo, uh, limestone expression in the, and I think it manifests itself in the wine there. Um, and, uh, you know, it just shows uh, so many aspects of uh, the region well, but, you know, maybe with the volume kicked up a little bit. There's a lot of clay in these soils too, ar around uh, around everything else too, particularly in uh, Monsieur Duvaux's uh, wines and specifically in the Onidia uh, vineyard. Um, pretty much straightforward as far as it goes there. Um, a little bit of neutral oak uh, for texture, mostly stainless steel. I do think more and more, we're, it, maybe they're publicizing it more, but maybe they're actually doing it more. And you mentioned this at the very beginning, uh, Madeline, a lot more um, focus on leaves uh, and leaves with these varieties um, that, that we um, uh, entertained in the past, neutral oak, etc. cetera. Um, gentleman's been around for a long time. The Duveau uh, family is in their eighth generation. Um, and uh, the most current generation, um, Fabien, if you will, is uh, taking over um, as of from his dad in 2008. And um, as you can see from this last bullet here, and so much as this is true, and you know, we, we underscore um, the importance in the Loire Valley and places where you can really do this, um, biodynamics, organics, um, all of that. I mean, even um, the comment made earlier by uh, Patricia about, you know, adding in chamomile and tisane at the end of the day to, you know, act on the grapes. I mean, there's a lot more um, thinking in terms of uh, diversity cultivation, viticulture um, in a natural way than there ever has been before. Um, I just thought this wine was uh, delightful. Oh, and can I jump in entree. with un Please un feel unbridled free. enthusiasm? Because yeah. Next. I think, you know, I hadn't actually, if you go back to the other slide, yeah. I know, totally cute. I want to go over, hold on. I, I like the Christmas pick card picture. Yeah, there. no, just hold the thought. We're going to see the family momentarily. But, you know, I hadn't really meditated on this uh, tech sheet because I knew that Evan was going to talk about this wine. But I'm paying, you know, for me, the wine never lies. No matter what is said about it, whatever's written about it, there's a part of me that's utterly silent listening to the wine. And what strikes me about this wine is the mid palate complexity of this wine and intensity of this wine. And then I'm looking at six months on the leaves in neutral barrel and there it is, I feel it. You know, Chanel's acidity is there absolutely at the topmost of my, um, you know, the sides of my palate, but it's not 
pulling my attention. It's not the elephant in the room. Um, what is, is that mid palate weight. I'm a big mid palate girl when it comes to, you know, holding the wine on my palate and just paying attention to that plum line of flavor and the mouthfeel. And I think the leaves and the neutral oak, the, you know, the neutral oak is loosening the wine. So it's more, I think, um, generous in its expression of flavor and the leaves uh, give it, you know, if Chenin could have a combination of, you know, sort of tart, limey acidity with um, this nice, smooth, silky, even satiny mouthfeel, here it is. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> no, I, I know. Not so much about aromatics to me at my tasting, but absolutely about mouthfeel. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and, and, and everything that if you look up Sancier, you know, and you spend time uh, talking about, it delivers on everything that this particular area is supposed to be all about, which is about the volume and all that. And I'm just, again, here's a wine called Samor. We don't think about Samor. Yes, we think about Vouvray. Yes, we think about Sauvignon. Yes, but Samor, oh, okay. And what a, what, a, what a mouthful of wine it delivers. It's just a, a delightful thing. And if we do move to that other picture, I just wanted to point out that if I were going to do a Hallmark card, I would use the picture on the right <laughs> side for my family at holiday. What a, what a handsome family, um, just all the way around and some beautifully handsome vines, I might add, to the left. So let's move on to Anjou. Thank you, Fabienne and Emmanuel. And I'm going to turn this back over to you, Madeline. Well, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, Florent is with us. Do we know if Florent is with us or not? I know. Yes, oh, there I see he is. Him. Hold on, Florent, just a moment. I won't say much because this is your subject and this is your wine. And I have to tell everyone that I have been lucky enough to use um, uh, Domaine de Bomar uh, seven year on multiple tastings. So I'm so happy not to be listening to myself talk about it too much, but to be listening to the man um, who made it. But just to put it in um, a frame of reference, we are in Anjou. Uh, which is, you know, again, broad strokes between Pays, Nantes to the, um, the west, Atlantic coast, and to the east, the Touraine that we've been talking about. Um, you know, if you read about Anjou history, I tried to and to shorthand it to you, but it's impossible, you know, other than to say that the expression of um, political power and its movement from hand to hand is, you know, Palpable. pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this uh, is an, palpable, palpable, uh, and you know, too much for my little brain to remember, um, uh, uh, early this morning in, uh, Detroit, um, we have such a range of expressions of Chenin Blanc here. And today we, you know, the ones that are very prominent are the dessert expressions, but the dry expression of Chenin Blanc, um, is from a tiny appellation called, uh, Sauvignon that I really think, and this is my opinion, even if Florent weren't here, is um, the fingerprint of dry Chenin Blanc at its best. And I will bet money has inspired much of the terrific old line Chenin Blanc in South Africa. And actually that's a question. I'm curious if Florent has any, um, you know, interaction with those guys or not. Can we go to the next slide? Um, you know, this is a region that was settled, meaning AKA invaded by <laughs> the Romans in, uh, uh, you know, way back when. Um, the uh, vineyards were established by, you know, monastic culture, no surprise, that happens everywhere in France. The soils are really unique, and Florent may talk to this, you know, this blue schist and volcanic debris that you um, have expressed on your website. And I think more than anything else, when I think of seven year, I think of that, you know, that term minerality that uh, we sommeliers tend to use. Uh, this is definitely wine that sommeliers adore. It is Chenin Blanc at its most concentrated, driest, and most age-worthy expression. So that's all I'm going to say. And I have to say how happy I am to meet you, Florent, because I've been um, a big fan of your wine for a long time. And welcome. I know we're all thrilled to have your company. Well, hello, hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Madeline, for this uh, wonderful precise explanations I, I, I won't have much to say so which is just as well and as you say the wine should talk for it for himself so uh, um, can you tell us a little bit just about this either this particular vintage or you know um, any winemaking um, 
methods that you employed uh, that we should be aware of just so we can appreciate it um, from the head and from the heart? Um, well, <clears throat> it, it, 20, it's 2018 you have, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes, yes. yes. Um, so it's, I'm drinking the same, so it's good. Um, we, 2018 was uh, about the only uh, kind vintage to us in, in the recent years. Uh, we had severe frost many times and 2018 was generous. Uh, it's, it's quite a classical expression of, of seven year, I would say, uh, at least for, for here I'm talking Beaumar uh, more than seven year wines in general. Um, the, the reason why I will not be more precise on, on, the, on the quality of the vintage uh, in more in details is that um, Chenin Blanc, as, as you mentioned uh, earlier, is, <clears throat> is, is a, a versatile grape and uh, it has, uh, it's a difficult grape in the sense that uh, it can produce both sweet and dry wines and uh, it, it uh, if I sum, summarize its qualities, it would be that it ripens unevenly. Uh, it's a, a vine which is quite vigorous and the grapes can rot easily and they can keep a good acidity when they're ripe, even if they're ripe uh, or very ripe. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's like a petulant child who, <laughs> yes, it, it, it really does what it wants, and you have to deal with. It needs patience and understanding to 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 come along to to be able to do something. Uh, like in in twenty twenty, for instance, uh, we had grapes that we're still going through Veraison uh, and at the same time we had grapes which were already beginning to have botrytis. Oh my, um, can I ask a question here because this is very interesting to me. Are you talking when it ripens at that unevenly, is it the cluster or within the cluster? Within the cluster. Oh my god, so it's a headache for you. It is, it is. <laughs> That's why I, I, I hate it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I have, I don't know if maybe, I don't know if this can be seen. Yes, mm -hmm. clearly. Yeah. Fantastic. Whoa. So that's, <laughs> this is not a Photoshop uh, bunch of gray. Oh, it, it is my. a picture I took just to show how, uh, you know, the different raisins you can get from one bunch. Wow. And, is and that in the, September? Is that in September or later? Uh, yes. Yeah, well, maybe it was early October. I took this grape a while ago, uh, but we, we get similar grapes every year. And, and so depending on, on, this obliges you to have a, a hand picking uh, and to select the, the grapes you want to make a dry wine or a sweet wine or a super sweet, rich wine or, uh, or a sparkling wine. Um, and as you know, uh, uh, well, th th this is uh, our secret to, to, to make uh, okay wines to drink. Uh, the sorting must be very important in your process of production then. Um, yes. Um, yes. Uh, it, it's 80% it's, it's, uh, uh, is picking the grapes at the right moment. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, 18% is, is uh, choosing them and transporting them to the cellar in full shape in order to, to squeeze them uh, in a way that allows us to, as, as they do in Champagne, uh, you know, we, we fraction, we separate the different juices mm -hmm. from the same press. So we have the acidic juice, the, the richer juice and the, the the, the juice with more tannins and they all go in different pans and and you know it's just like when you cook if you if you put the carrots and the onions in the same pan at the same moment 
um, you, the, the onions would be burnt uh, before the carrots uh, begin to turn into anything. And so... Um, that's a brilliant so, analogy. That's a brilliant you know, analogy. I have to tell you, in tasting this wine, Florent, if you don't mind my, my describing it, I think on the palate, again, mid-palate, if you just hold it on your palate, you have this fantastic concentration. It tastes like if there were to be such a thing, dry honey. It's got like a honey character, miel en français, n'est-ce pas? Uh, yes. Mais sec, pas doux. And um, I just think that it's also dried flowers and, and, and dried honey. Before I forget to ask, who is this handsome young gentleman in the picture with you? <laughs> it's my eldest son who, <laughs> who, who just joined us uh, this past month. And he's, uh, we're trying to see if we can do something together. <laughs> uh, ah, bravo. Good. You know, somebody just asked the question, go back to the food analogy. When you're sauteing your onions, you don't want them. Uh, what was that analogy that you don't want them onions overdone and before the but carrots? <laughs> it's nothing to do with the taste or, or the, it's just uh, the texture. Onions, you cut, you slice them and you put them in a pan. And uh, if the pan is warm enough, uh, a few seconds later, they, they turn, all the water goes out and then they burn, kind of. They, they, they become delicious. Um, carrots, they need more time. They, need, they prefer uh, vapeur or... Uh, steam. Mm -hmm. Steam, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so for the, the, the grapes, it's just the same. Uh, a grape that has... Uh, at early stage of botrytis, like if I put my my mm -hmm. uh, I, I, don't, I don't see you, so I don't know if oh, I can we see it. It's we can picture. see it. Yes, mm -hmm. you can see it. Yep. Yes. Um, let, let me. Uh, Bravo! Perfect. That's it. Mm -hmm. Right there. You see it? Mm -hmm. I, I don't. Is yeah. there? A, there's a brown one <clears throat> on mm -hmm. the left part or right part. I don't know. Well, it's it's in full shape, but it's brown. And that grape is you, you, was just like the one next to it, which was yellow or green, um, a day or two before. It's early stage of botrytis. That means if you pass your finger on on the skin, the skin sticks to your finger, and but the flesh of the raisin is not of the grape is not touch at all. So if you eat that raisin, you don't have the tannic hmm. uh, feeling you get from the skins. You, the so you don't get you don't get that bitter phenolic uh, character at exactly. all. Exactly. This wine but, is all potential to me. I, I'm interrupting you only because I don't want us to forget to address the ageability of seven year. What happens when these wines are five, 10, 15 years old, Florent? What do they smell and taste like? Is the acidity different? Um, the perception of the acidity will be different. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on the vintage, uh, it will vary a lot. Uh, and you may feel some kind of aromatical sweetness, but uh, of course, this is bone dry, meaning less than two grams, uh, and, and it will never become sweeter, but the feeling might be sweeter. It's like and, brut nature, but your perception is that it's, I loved what you said, like an aromatic uh, sweetness. It's an illusion of sweetness, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. And, and so on, on, on cold vintages, uh, like 2004, for instance, where the wines were almost undrinkable until 10 years, until they were 10 years old. They're just beginning to, to, to open. So the, the influence of the vintage is, is very, very uh, important. And so uh, for consumers, I would say that if you open one of our bottles, uh, well, like 18 today, for me, this wine, it's, it's drinkable, but it's infanticide. Also, uh, <laughs> what, what, what if you had to drink it young? Because I'm a, I hate to break this news to you. A lot of Americans will drink it too young because we have enthusiasm for you. Um, what would be your favorite food to go with it? Ah, uh, well, maybe a ceviche of uh, ceviche, huh? yes, 
mm -hmm. or there, there are wines that that can match uh, rather well different kind of spices, uh, salt and sugar, also uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, they, they can, uh, of course, uh, on this vintage, I would prefer uh, seafood and, and uh, uh, fish. Uh, right, yeah. You know, a smoked fish or a, a fish. more than yeah, a fish. This wine, but, uh, or a this wine can handle a smoked right. fish. And you may not think that you had a lot to say, but you just gave us a 10 minute masterclass. Absolutely. And, and what I was gonna, and Blanc. <laughs> yeah, what I was going to say is and just a reminder to everybody out there, uh, Florent will be sticking around in our happy half hour and we, we can dialogue more. But um, in deference to time, wanting to hit a few questions and wanting to cover our vrai uh, to finish off the uh, the cherry on this Sunday of wines that we've had today. Um, thank you, Florent. That was masterful. And I wrote down a ton of notes I'll be using in the future. But let's uh, let's finish thank our you. discussion of uh, Chenin with Vouvray. Um, and uh, another area, as, as all of the areas we've talked about, both with Chenin and notably in the Loire too, uh, an area with tremendous history, uh, in this case, dating back to 372. Um, this city, this uh, appellation, as we know, begins just to the east of, uh, of Tours. And again, um, along the lines of some more we were talking about before, um, hits a couple of different communes um, on the right bank of the Loire and along the other, yet another tributary, the Bren. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating area, important to note, um, the sort of flint, this sort of silex thing we talked about before, but clay and chalk, obviously, on the floor. And very important to note, unlike some of the, area, the other areas we talked about before, where you do see um, uh, different grapes playing around here, happy in the sandbox next to each other. This is for Chenin Blanc only, um, but it, Chenin Blanc only, not simple. Uh, a huge range of styles from uh, the driest of dry to tendre to uh, demi-sec to do to moelleux to everything in before and of course they make uh, sparkling vouvray too so an uh, incredible diversity in one grape this would be the counterpoint the bookend of my other conversation if i was going to use one region to do a dinner i do all uh loire valley if i was going to use one appellation within the loire to do dinner i'd probably do all vouvray because i could cover off everything that i wanted to do so our final wine today Last but certainly not least, uh, comes from the house of Vigno Chevreau. Uh, and this is their Cuvée Silex uh, Sec. Um, as we saw before, uh, this is a wine defined by its place, defined by its uh, soil type. And here, Silex, uh, the Sicilius thing in the flint. I mean, really, to me, when I think about Silex, I think about flint stones making up this sort of aggregate along with other terroirs, but really defining uh, the particular area. What I like about this wine for me and what I, what I enjoy when I taste it is, you know, we've talked about several other elements here, but the sort of what I call, for lack of better words, classic, although well, classic is a difficult word to use, but hitting on the quince, hitting on the, the baked apple, hitting on the honey and honeysuckle elements of, uh, of what Chenin, for a lot of us, were taught as our markers, and particular to Vouvray, I think the wine speaks to those um, in, this, uh, in this particular um, bottling. What I think is interesting is that last point there, which is, and, and I was beautiful that uh, Florent sort of talked to us about literally triaging, if you will, on the, within that here. Here, obviously, it's before it's harvested, but, but thinking about which grapes, which wine, and noting that the younger vines go for the sparkling wine that they make, yet the over 30 ones go into the still wine making. So um, using the younger, wine, younger vines for the bubbles and the, uh, the more mature vines for the still. What are, your, what are your thoughts on this wine? I know you've been so chatty today about the wines and so good at it. What are you, what are you getting here? <laughs> Thank you for letting me be chatty, Evan. You know, here I am because I'm incapable of making up my mind without a pen in my hand. That comes from Catholic girls boarding school, if you can imagine that. But in any event, um, uh, what is very interesting to me about this Louvre is, and does it, is it expressed as uh, Cuvée Silex Sec on the mm -hmm. label, yeah. because one thing that is a little bit uh, maddening about Vouvray is even from grape producers, they're not often or always specific about the dryness level, AKA Alsace, you know, has the same bad habit. But this one is a great expression, a very concentrated dry Chenin. And uh, I, I must be into shoulders today because the comment I made was this is very well, look at the next um, picture. Let, no, let me turn deep, the slide. Look, yes. shoulders. Well, there we go on the right. You know, <laughs> there are the guys, you know, and those are 
those are powerful skulls as well. This is a broad shoulder Chenin ball. This is not ballerina wine. This is, um, you know, I, I want to get away from using the terms masculine and feminine and be more sort of inclusive in descriptions. But this is four square Chenin Blanc. You know, in that respect, it reminds me of Brunner Veltliner that isn't, you know, has, doesn't have it at all the same aromatics, but has this wonderful without oak uh, presence of, um, of power. And I think this is also an expression of biodynamic viticulture and it's hard to put your finger on it, but you get more concentration. You, oh, somebody said, I want this on Thanksgiving. That's because you want to make yourself happy. You know, <laughs> the one thing I, I would say that this wine lacks, and this is not a negative thing, of, of, of such a, uh, an expression of powerful dry shana, it does not have much of an illusion of sweetness. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. is all about like maybe whispers of things like peach and apricot, um, you know, and flowers, but it's more about concentration and, um, and uh, breadth and depth. Would you agree with that, Evan? Yeah, no, no, I would. And I, I would also go back to that time, that time honored things that, that wine, that wines look like, taste like their winemakers. And, you know, if, if there was, a, you know, like a, you got these like very lean, tall gentlemen and their wines are lean and tall and you get the sort of short stout Burgundians, Rome guys and got the power. Uh, this wine is very much speaks to exactly the, the, the physical format of the, the two gentlemen here, very costo and very, uh, and very deep and uh, the wines that way too. I would concur with you about that comment there. Um, and, and, and I think that this one in that regard, um, you'd speak the, the classics of sort of the Apple Quincy thing come through more to me than that sort of layered, perhaps a little less on that, that kind of baked thing and more on that, uh, the, the other thing, but just a lovely wine. And I concur this would be good on, on um, Thanksgiving, which is not too far off. So and with, you know what yeah. I would do? I would what put would this right next. I would put right, this right next to Florent Seven Year in my cellar. This is where you buy, you know, four to six bottles mm -hmm. instead of one, right. and you sort of open one every other year and see what happens. How to they're it. developing together, side by side. That's a good thing. I might have to do that. I'm going to have to look at that. <laughs> well, as we move into our last slide, which is going to be Li Mang for your cue to open it up, we're going to have some. Uh, some Q&A here. And Li Meng, why don't you, because um, I have not been, I'm, again, I'm not that capable of following questions and doing presentations at the same time, but I'm sure there's um, some questions. And to the extent that we can bring in um, Emma and bring in Florent and bring in Patricia as well too to, to um, enjoy that. And then as a reminder, and I'll close it with my last slide in about 10 minutes, um, we'll have our, Q, our our happy half hour afterwards, but let's take a, advantage. I always try and put some side, time aside for Q&A. So Limeng, please throw some questions at us. Great. Uh, we have one question for you, Florent. Uh, this is from Christopher. Does it feel almost like making this wine, the Beaumard, is more about the skill in assemblage versus the maintenance of the actual vineyard? Both. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. One word covers it all. <laughs> Dude, I I can, I, I, For me, I can, yeah, go ahead. No, I can develop, but, but it, it could be long, but uh, go for no, it. It's, it's really, it, it's a whole thing. You know. So, so for me, from the silly question, I guess, for me for the day, as I'm looking at this picture of all these different development of the grapes, how does one sort through and how does one ferment? You know, do you, is it batched out? How are you doing this? Well, they, the, the, they all ferment differently because they have uh, less, you know, some parts of the juice has more natural yeast mm -hmm. uh, and then if it's cold it, it, it takes some time to start but if it's warm uh, and it's very mature it can ferment very quickly then you have to to moderate this fast fermentation and and again it's like it's like cooking when you have five pans with different things in on the fire yeah. you you have to keep on moving them and turning it on off tasting, deciding, changing your uh, possible blendings. And, uh, and there's no recipe because uh, when you go to the market, uh, you, you had something in mind. I want to make the greatest uh, dry white wine, of course. 
And, uh, but then, you know, half of the grapes are not exactly as you wanted them to be. So, so you have to begin cooking in bracket differently. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no nice cooking thing. really, but it's just playing with what we have. And playing mm -hmm. is, is, is a nice word. It's not always a, a fun game. <laughs> oh, it's a difficult game. But, it, but the cooking the cooking analogy or metaphor is perfect. Um, and for people who do cook out there, I think we can all totally relate to the fact that you go to the supermarket with an idea in mind and you see what's there and you have to change on the fly because if you were waiting for a specific vegetable or piece of fruit or a cut of meat or a, a specific fish and you don't find it, um, you either are spending the rest of the day trying to find it, and maybe there's a reason why you're not finding it, because it's not very good uh, in the market at large, but um, having that ability to breathe and um, adjust uh, is, uh, you know, you don't think about it as much in winemaking, perhaps, as one does in cooking, but the skill is every bit as applicable. Great. Um, just just, just one, one thing on, on that, because of the, the cooking analogy is, is, for me, I use it a lot because uh, it's it's uh, it's the way I experience. But cooking is much more difficult, especially if you own a restaurant and you have to serve you know x number of plates, different things, and because ev on your judge on every plate, and a dinner lasts a few hours, uh, while we have a year to do that, and so. Uh, uh, the comparison it has its limits in the sense that mm -hmm. cooking is something much, much more precise and needs uh, inspiration and, and uh, talent. With, with our grapes, we have, you know, where we can, it's a slow, slow cooking. <laughs> <laughs> slow that's, that's great. Um, I, I want to remind everyone that we do have a happy half hour. So if you want to stay on. Madeline, Evan, and I, and Florent, and Patricia, and Emma, we will be here for a little bit more. Um, we have a question here for Patricia. Uh, there was some talk about chamomile on wine number two. <laughs> there was that Tizan um, discussion. Can you go into a bit more detail on that, how it's done, and on the nose, uh, and on more on the winemaking, or is it biodynamic preparation that's driving that? Um, so it's, um, uh, it's something that we do in the vineyard. So we use, uh, chamomile, um, like for, like for us, like for anyone, or like for a human, uh, we put chamomile in hot water and after we spray chamomile, uh, on the vines in the vineyard, uh, to, to... When, when do you do that, Patricia? At what, what point in time do you do that? When, when, sorry, which, which when, 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 you, yeah. when um, we do that, uh, when, when the day is very hot uh, and uh, when the vines miss water, uh, when there is a stress, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, we, we are not sure about that, but we think that uh, it's, uh, it's, good for the vine for the vineyard and uh, in, in biodynamy we use a lot of uh, tisane and decoction ah there you go great uh, we have one more question and then i'm going to give everybody the choice to show your video and speak and ask your questions directly um this question could be for florent patricia or emma um your viticultural practices how are they being adapted right now for frost and hail in the Loire Valley? Patricia, à toi l'honneur. <laughs> Did that question make sense? It does. Florent, I think go for it, Florent, if, you, if you're able to answer it. Okay, uh, because uh, I, Patricia was talking, but I don't know, no one oh. could hear. Sorry. Ah, yes. ah sorry, we did. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I couldn't uh, understand the beginning of the question, just the end. Ah, just what kind of viticultural practices are you using to combat frost and hail in mm -hmm. the Loire Valley? 
Uh, unfortunately, um, in Medeto Salon, we don't have anything to against frost, uh, but we are we are thinking about it because we we have more and more problems with frost. For hell, it's a bit different uh, because we often have hell mm -hmm. in the Centre Loire, so we. Uh, it's a bit difficult to explain in, in English. Vas-y, vas allez-y en français. français. Oui, 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 je peux très bien. Donc, euh, on, on, a un système, euh, on a un système de générateurs qui, le, qui est réparti un peu sur tout le vignoble, sur, enfin, sur tout le centre Loire, et qui envoie euh, du iodure d'argent mm -hmm. pour casser, au, au lieu d'avoir un gros grêlon, Mm -hmm. So what they do is they actually, shoot, from the generators, they actually shoot, qu'est-ce que vous, c'est en argent, c'est un oxyde argent? Iodure d'argent. Comment de l'argent? Iodure d'argent. Yeah, there's a type of like silver oxide that they can shoot and it actually, you can't kill the hail, if you will, but you can make it smaller and less impactful than it would be otherwise. Sort of like seeding clouds or something like that, if you can imagine um, what, the, what that is all about. For people, when you're trying to make rain, you add silver oxide into the clouds to precipitate rain. Here they're shooting it up the other way to try and make the hail smaller and less impactful than it would be otherwise. So. Silver oxide is uh, argent what in French? Argent, c'est quoi en français en quoi Patricia? L'argent? Iodure. D'argent. Viodure oui. d'argent. Iodure. 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 Iode, iode et argent. Iode, uh, iode et argent, ok. okay. Uh, but uh, I think um, um, some people who prune, prune the vineyard uh, later had less problem with frost this year. Mm -hmm. Liman, can we go over the last slide before we open things up, just because mm -hmm. there's some housekeeping there that I'd love to go, go over. It. So, uh, merci bien. That's what I would say to everybody, to uh, <laughs> our speakers, our panelists, to Emma, to the support of Inter Loire. Um, for all of you out there, merci bien for taking the time uh, to join us today. And please remember to submit your survey as soon as possible. It's very important for the sponsors. It's very important for us uh, to be able to learn and grow from it and uh, know what we can do better next time. And now um, we're going to connect to the happy half hour for more specific questions, opportunity to see each other and chat together. And I got nothing else, Lee Mang. It's all of you from here. <laughs> uh, just remember. And Madeline. Thank you, Madeline. Semester. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Madeline. And tomorrow's session, if you're leaving us right now, is at 10 a.m. same uh, time as today. And you should have on your invitation the bit.ly link uh, for that session as well. And tomorrow is all about Anton Weich and Portugal. So we're going to switch gears completely. <laughs>